Welcome to the Tech Money Podcast, where the worlds of technology and personal finance collide. Hosted by certified financial planner, speaker, blogger, and self-proclaimed personal finance nerd, Malcolm Etheridge. Each episode aims to make you just a little bit smarter about your money, all from the perspective of the tech professional. Without further delay, here's your host. Hey there, listeners. Malcolm here. And I'm joined, as always, here in the virtual studio by my producer, Eric with an A. With Bitcoin breaching its all-time high of $19,000 again, there's been quite a bit of excitement and conversation out there on the interwebs about this being the time to get in again, which means I also started to get bombarded once again with questions from friends and a few clients on whether or not to invest in it. And since I do not pretend to be an expert in cryptocurrency by any means, I figured I'd call up the one guy I know who's smarter than all of us when it comes to this stuff and have a conversation with him. So Samson is a professor and earns his living lecturing uh, on the ins and outs of fintech. He's also a person who organizes who organizations pay to uh, fly around the world and speak on the subject pretty regularly. So with that brief introduction, uh, welcome Samson Williams to the Tech Money Podcast. Hello, hello, beautiful people. I'm super excited to join you, uh, Malcolm, here on the Tech Money Podcast. And I just want to say, as a disclaimer, I'm not an expert. I mean, I teach at a couple of universities, but there are no experts in cryptocurrencies. They're just fools at different levels of discovery. So I just want to be (laughs) clear about that. So, you know what, that's a that's a great entree into you as a person in general that you would categorize it that way. So I'm going to have you introduce yourself a little more fully first. I teach at a couple of universities. I teach at University of New Hampshire School of Law. I created a blockchain cryptocurrency and law uh, certification program for them. And that was really for if you're an entrepreneur or you're in a startup or an existing business and you're looking at blockchain technology, you were paying six to $800 an hour to provide on the job training to mm-hmm. lawyers to introduce them to distributed ledger technology, blockchain, the, ver- the verbiage of decentralized tech, as well as cryptocurrencies. So at the law school there, we help demystify blockchain for the lawyers. We also have a lot of non-lawyers, particularly from the banking and regulatory space, who just want to have an understanding of blockchain, the tech and its applications. And then I teach over at Columbia University of New York, which I didn't know was in in Harlem until I went up there last year to teach in person. And I stayed two months in Harlem, which was a fantastic experience. But that's outside of teaching there at Columbia. But we also teach about... Uh, fintech, AI, machine learning, the fifth industrial revolution, which is the space economy. Basically, any buzzword you've heard, we give a practical introduction to it so that people can understand like, oh, they've reinvented the abacus blockchain. I get it. Okay, I'm very excited about this. (laughs) Of all the things to build a career around, why fintech and why crypto? It's where the world's going. Everyone's talking about data is the new oil, data is the new gold. So if Data is new oil, data is new gold, but you're still in an analog world. You're still pushing paper. You're not going to be part of that next industrial revolution and that next uh, moment of wealth gain. Really, all this leads up to the space economy, which is a longer separate discussion. But very briefly, if it's 1993, I'm trying to tell you about the Internet economy. You're like, mm-hmm. what's that? But now all the only trillion dollar companies are in the Internet economy. The space economy will make the Internet economy look like somebody's hobby. And so Mm. this is why I'm in fintech and crypto is a part of it because once you get into space and you use blockchain as infrastructure, it's plumbing, all the quote unquote blockchain enthusiasts, they're really like Mario and Luigi from Nintendo. They're plumbers. (laughs) They just don't know it yet. I always feel like I'm like such an old man and I'm going to get left behind whenever I talk to you. So thanks a lot. But I, (laughs) so I, we've kind of shortened it, abbreviated it saying crypto, obviously people are smart enough to put together crypto as cryptocurrency, but give us a quick primer, man. What exactly is cryptocurrency? Cryptocurrency in short is a religion. You could call it (laughs) money, you could call it currency, but it's really a religion. I'm an anthropologist by training, which sort of makes me like a historian. Paper money was introduced by the Khans, by Genghis Khan in China. And he did this by saying, if you didn't use his paper money, which was made of tree bark, he would murder you. Wow. That's why people started using paper money. They thought this is a good idea. And so fast forward, we don't murder people anymore, but money, the concept of money and currency, it evolved into be a record of debt. Hmm. As a record of debt, that record of debt has gone digital with blockchain technology. The Bitcoin is a record of debt 
And so money has always been a record of debt. And so the difference with the Bitcoin uh, record of debt is that it's encrypted and it's encrypted so well that you can display your Bitcoin record of debt publicly. We're not saying that the concept of currency or money is anything new. It mm -hmm. is crypto in the fact that it's encrypted and it's digital. And that's actually digital money is as old as Diners Club, which was the first <laughs> credit card that came out in 1956. So it's a it's a new take on an old religion of money. Samson, I'm going to jump in here real quick because Malcolm says you make him feel old sometimes. And I'm way older than Malcolm. <laughs> so uh -huh. I, I'm, I'm trying to figure out this stuff too. And I know that that's why you're on the show today. But I remember a news article that uh, for Bitcoin specifically that I think one of the first things purchased was pizza, right? Mm -hmm. For 10,000 Bitcoin. And we started off this show, I think Malcolm said that it, it topped $19,000 per Bitcoin, right? Is that correct? Yeah. And so those pizzas were, they cost $190 million is what you're telling me? Well, that's, that's the thing when you're dealing with religion, you should never let facts stand in the way of belief. <laughs> All right. <laughs> it, I'll, I'm going to explain it to you very, <laughs> I'm going to explain it to you very, very simply. Cause it's like, why are people believing that this Bitcoin is worth X? And it's funny because every Christmas, whenever Christmas rolls around, we have a $100 billion a year industry based upon belief. <laughs> There's a fat guy who's gonna come down your chimney and deliver you gifts. And it's like, but my house doesn't have a chimney. And so people, humans, we love these agreed upon fictions. Uh, one of the biggest agreed upon fictions there are businesses, right? Whether it's an LLC or an Inc. And we agree that these businesses exist. And it's even why businesses are people now per Citizens United, because we love agreed upon fictions. So when you say, oh, Bitcoin, it's worth $19,000. It's worth, it's going to be worth $300,000. The, that's not only an agreed upon fiction, that is just the belief that it will be. To take a step back, the title of the Bitcoin white paper, it's called Bitcoin, an electronic, uh, an, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. If you think about the people who are saying, oh, Bitcoin's going to be worth $300,000, right? It's very similar to if you're harvesting sunlight, you're collecting sunlight to turn it into solar power. And all these mm. people are out there collecting, they're collecting dollars and turning them into digital currencies or electronic cash that is called Bitcoin. You're out there collecting sunlight and you're just holding on to it and you never use that sunlight. What are you powering? Nothing. So why are you collecting sunlight? So in this current era, it's like, oh, we believe that Bitcoin is going to be worth $300,000. And if you, the very way to get that this is a belief system, just ask, how does Bitcoin generate revenue? And then there's that big pause because it's like um, more people buy Bitcoin. I'm like, that's how it generates revenue. No, Bitcoin goes up in value because more people are buying it because someone was able to buy Bitcoin at 10,000. Now it's at 19,000 because people are driving up the price because of demand. I'm like, okay, so then what do you do with Bitcoin? I believe that's what we in uh, economics refer to as the greater fool theory, right? That somebody yes. will always be a greater fool than you will, who's willing to come behind you and pay more for it than you did. I want to not even necessarily break this up, but sort of dumb it down just a little bit, if I may. And I hate to use that phrase, but I have to, because then other otherwise people won't know what I'm saying. I've heard you use the the phrase or the story around a group text thread, and that analogy is the word I'm looking for. So you've used the the analogy of a group text thread to describe to me how blockchain works and how blockchain being the technology that powers all these cryptocurrencies actually operates. Could you walk us through mm -hmm. that one real quick? Yeah, we should have started at this now. It make it'll make so much more sense. I forget <laughs> this. Blockchain is a technology that Bitcoin is built upon. And then as well as these other 3,500 or so other cryptocurrencies, right? They're all built on this blockchain technology. And blockchain is the sexy marketing name for decentralized ledger tech. When you're dealing with decentralized ledger tech, you have records of data that are distributed, timestamped, encrypted, and public. And so if you're looking at those criteria for blockchain, they're distributed, timestamped records of data that are public. It's very similar to a a group text message. So Malcolm and Eric and with an A and I are on a group text message. I have $5. I send Malcolm a dollar. Malcolm sends Eric 25 cents. And so in that group text message, we've exchanged data. 
That's literally it. It's a ledger because you can scroll up, you can scroll down. Everyone mm -hmm. can see that I started with $5 and I sent Malcolm a buck and he sent Eric 25 cents. Eric can't now say, oh, I have $250,000. We're like, Eric, we're all looking at the same group text message. <laughs> you got 25 cents player. That's, that is literally blockchain in a nutshell because it, it's a text message. It's Eric's phone number might be 555-555-555, right? He's pseudonymous. We don't actually know that that's Eric. We just see this phone number. But we know that this number, 555, it got 25 cents from a person we do know who is Malcolm. And through the magic of research, we can figure out, oh, who is Eric? Which is why, this is a warning for everybody, if you plan on laundering money, you will absolutely, positively go to jail if you use Bitcoin <laughs> because you have created a distributed hmm. timestamp record of all of the illegal things you just did. And it's public. So Yikes. I tell people, if you want to launder money, you want to use something that you can't track, you want to use something that has no owner, and that thing is called cash. I doubt any money launderers or wannabe money launderers are listening to the Tech Money podcast, but I'm glad I guess you threw that nugget out there just in case. For the folks that are on the right side of right, are there any ways to invest in blockchain technology that are not necessarily obvious? And feel free to use words like pseudonymous again. Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, pseudonymous means I will I can figure out who you are versus anonymous, which means I have cash is anonymous. Because once I give it to Malcolm, that $100, it's gone. It was never belonged to me. But Bitcoin, again, it creates that text message ledger. And if you doubt in that text message ledger, so that I can figure out why, why did I give, you, give him this money? When we talk about investing in blockchain technology, what's not obvious is the first thing is that you can't actually invest in blockchain. You can only invest in the businesses that use blockchain. And again, it's hard to explain this to the religious fanatics. They're like, no, Bitcoin, <laughs> blockchain, one and the same. We're going to the moon, Lambo moon, Lambo moon, hashtag, right? And it's like, no, you can't invest in blockchain. And I'll give you an example. That's like saying, hey, Eric, do you want to invest in HTML? And you'll be like, what? What's HTML? I'm like, oh, it's the thing that makes the www dot work. You're like, what's the www dot? The World Wide Web. I probably couldn't convince Eric or your listeners to invest in HTML tech because mm -hmm. they wouldn't, they'd be like, why? It's like so ubiquitous, it's boring. Hence why in the future, blockchain will be plumbing, but we'll get back to that. If you want to invest in HTML, you don't actually invest in HTML because that's like saying, hey, I'm going to invest in Comcast because Comcast mm -hmm. is an internet service provider. They actually run the web. If I give you an option, we could time travel back to, let's say 2003, and I give you the option, Malcolm, do you want to invest in Comcast, which does this internet thing, or do you mm -hmm. want to invest in this company called Amazon, which sells books on the internet? Which one do you pick? In 1993, I'm probably picking Comcast. So you're going to pick Comcast. You're like, yeah, I'm going to invest in the internet thing. Also because Amazon doesn't exist in 1993. But <laughs> uh, Com Comcast is internet technology. However, Amazon uses the internet technology to be a thousand times more profitable and valuable than Comcast. Mm -hmm. And so when people say, oh, I want to invest in blockchain technology, you do not want to be owning Comcast shares if the other option is owning the, the same amount of Amazon shares. Another really invest, good analogy. Yes, you wanna invest. I just gave my credit for a good analogy. I gave myself credit for a good analogy. That's really funny. You actually don't wanna invest in Comcast, in the internet businesses. You wanna invest in the businesses that use the internet to make trillions, and let me just say this again, trillions of dollars. You don't invest in blockchain, right? You invest in the businesses that will be the Amazons who use blockchain to make mm -hmm. trillions and quadrillions of dollars, but you can only make quadrillions of dollars in the space economy. But that's another conversation. <laughs> so do you see crypto as something that will one day use to purchase goods and services like more than just that pizza here in the United States at some point? Oh, yeah, you could go to like um, 99bitcoins.com. And they'll give you a big old list of who uses, uh, who accepts Bitcoin. And again, Bitcoin, it, it can be used as a currency per the IRS and the CFTC and the SEC, the Commodities and Future Trade Commission, the Securities and Exchange Commission. Bitcoin is an asset. It's taxed differently. So you need to be aware of that. Particularly now PayPal says, hey, you're going to be able to use Bitcoin to anywhere PayPal is, will, is accepted in 2021. But you have a, every time you convert your Bitcoin into fiat or cash or U.S. government-backed 
money, that creates mm -hmm. a taxable event. So you don't know that yet, but you're about to pay everyone who's like, oh, I'm gonna use my Bitcoin to buy a coffee. I'm like, welcome to your taxable event every morning. <laughs> Even now, Microsoft, AT&T, Burger King, KFC, uh, Overstock, Subway, uh, Twitch, the Miami Dolphins, the Dallas Mavericks, Virgin Galactic, for Norwegian Air, I'm just reading the list. There's like a couple hundred uh, businesses. They will accept Bitcoin as a, as a way of paying for things. And really, when you think about it, uh, Malcolm, for you and your listeners, the challenge with people or businesses accepting Bitcoin is the same challenge I have with using my American Express. Mm -hmm. Some people, so many businesses do not accept American Express. Why? Well, that's they what I was going to say. In, fees. in the example you just gave me, I've got to go on a website, pull down the list, read the list to determine if the thing that I want to go buy is available on that company's platform, right? But we're in an age where Google Chrome will ask me anytime I buy something with a new credit card on that browser, do you want me to store these buying credentials so that you don't have to go through the trouble of finding your credit card and putting in those numbers every single time you go to buy something? Like that's where we are now. So I obviously don't wanna to have to go to a website and read a list of anything before I can do my online shopping. That defeats the whole purpose. And now I've had a chance to talk myself out of buying that item. So I'm curious if you see a way or a world where it's widely accepted, it's at least as ubiquitous as Amex, right? To use your example, since they're not accepted every single where, but they're in most places that have any sense, right? Do you see that world anytime soon? Yes, only because again, we're going into a digital age, mm -hmm. you'll need financial products that were designed for 100% digital ecosystems. Because hmm. I keep saying the space economy, and I, I literally mean the fifth industrial revolution, which is your IoT devices, your internet of thing devices, like you probably have on an Apple Watch, a smartwatch, a Pebble or whatever. There's a, probably a wallet already attached to that. So you can go and pay for anything, just scan your own, particularly because of COVID, you don't want to touch anything. So you just scan your watch and it pays for it. And not me. I'm Bitcoin. worried about surveillance, but I, I take oh, your well, point. Oh, we're going to talk about that later because <laughs> you, we, there will be a space for digital currencies. Even the Federal Reserve Board, they're looking at uh, CBDC, central bank digital currencies. And again, that's just a, another religion that says, hey, money is a record of debt. You should use our product, which is a central bank digital currency versus Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. So yes, you will be able to go into whichever store. But the question is, how easy and convenient is it for you to do that? And that's really boils mm -hmm. down to, from a regulatory perspective, what's gonna happen in underneath the Biden administration. Has the regulatory appetite changed any as of late? Uh, I would say yes. There's this gentleman named Brian Brooks. I know him from back in the day when I worked at Fannie Mae. He was a chief, he was a chief legal officer at Fannie Mae. Then he went to Coinbase mm -hmm. and now he's over, he just got appointed to the OCC, the Office of Comp Controller. He speaks, he speaks digital currency fluently. He speaks cryptocurrency fluently. So the reason he's so important is that he will talk to the other regulators at the FDIC, because you want your cryptocurrencies to be insured. Mm -hmm. He will talk to the SEC so that you understand that Bitcoin is a commodity. That's why the CFTC governs it versus some of the other cryptocurrencies out there like Ripple, who's going through their class action lawsuit, because in my opinion, they were unregistered security. So Brian Brooks is going to help communicate to the other regulators what the future of digital currencies look like. And at the same time, this other Brian named Brian Armstrong, he's a CEO of Coinbase. And Coinbase is just a very large exchange that makes it easy for you to buy and sell not only Bitcoin, but I think it's like 20 other cryptocurrencies. The regulations will continue to evolve because even our governments are looking at how do we create digital currencies and you sort of touched upon it there's so many reasons this is so it creates so many moral hazards so many actual hazards because already in 2020 20 percent of the cash that's currently in circulation was created this year and they don't mm -hmm. actually print money they just move the decimal point on the ledger when they create these they create new debt a stimulus bill is debt that our great great grandchildren will need to figure out how to pay off when you think about digital currencies and cryptocurrencies and adoption, yes, we will move in that direction, but it presents so many moral hazards because already I uh, feel like 97% of the money that banks have, they created mm -hmm. loans, they just create new debt. And this is why at the end of the day, money, as you, what you think about as money is actually a record of debt. It's gonna happen. 
Facebook Libra is Libra coin cryptocurrency is supposed to launch in January 2021. And then you're going to see a fight between the Federal Reserve Board, who's a private entity, who's quasi government and Facebook, who's not quasi government, but can turn an election. They're going to battle <laughs> out who has the right, who has the right to make up to print digital currencies. Because when you print digital currencies, you don't actually print money. You, again, you enter a new value into your ledger and you say, I've just created $500 billion that my Dude, users use. So, so as usual, you and I have kind of found our way into the nerdy little details of this thing and have to rescue us from that space. But okay, okay. so this will be my last, my last rabbit hole question to get us there. And then I'll, I'll kind of move on. But I think this one's important because you've made the case to me in the past that the U S is going to get left behind in the crypto race simply because of what you were just talking about, constantly battling against people who are trying to innovate in the space instead of trying to figure out a way to work together in the same sandbox. I mean, I guess play together in the same sandbox is the, is the, the euphemism, but how's this technology already being adopted in other places that you've seen around the world? Before the Rona, I was in Amsterdam. I was going through the airport and I made a video about, hey, look at this amazing airport. Everything's automated. Like how you get your ticket, how you check your bags, everything's automated. I love it to death. In that airport, there's a little, there's a kiosk where you can pay with something called Alipay. I'm sorry, WeChat Pay. WeChat's a messenger messaging service, very similar to WhatsApp. You're able to use that messaging service to pay for things. That's already in existence. And the reason WeChat is important because they have about 1.2 billion daily users who use WeChat to pay for stuff, primarily in China and nations that fall underneath the influence of China, which includes most of Africa. Digital currencies and point of sale systems for digital currencies, they already exist. Here in America, we're sort of messing around with Google Pay, Apple Pay, et cetera. We're behind not just in crypto, the US is behind not just in cryptocurrency technology and blockchain technology. We, we blew the internet race. We dominated the internet, we, we invented it, we created it, and then mm -hmm. we commercialized it to the point where internet Wi-Fi is a human right. Because as you transfer all your government services on the internet, we still have a digital divide in the US. It's about 50-50. And mm -hmm. the pandemic has really shown that half the kids can't go to school because they live in impoverished communities and don't have access to the internet. And so it's not just that we lost the blockchain race, we lost the internet race. We blew that 30 year lead. And so mm -hmm. as we think about how we're gonna transform digital innovation in America, part of it is we're gonna have to break up the Amazons, break up the Googles, break up the, I, the internet service providers and allow fresh new startups and entrepreneurs to enter into the market and make it more competitive. That whole new internet thing strikes me as, as eerily similar to the, uh, the premise of that show Silicon Valley on uh, HBO. Speaking of the internet of things, right? So Ray Dalio, the famed hedge fund manager, has been on a crusade the last few weeks against Bitcoin and cryptocurrency more broadly. Primarily, he's saying that it doesn't work well as a medium of exchange or a store of value like gold, which I imagine you disagree, at least to some to some degree. But assuming I'm right about you being anti Ray Dalio statements, why is he wrong? I, I think that the fanatics on both sides, remember, we're talking about religion. Mm -hmm. Gold by itself is not valuable. And people are like, no, Samson, I can get so much stuff for it. I'm like, no, gold is still just a record of debt. The mm -hmm. reason that Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies work better than gold is, have you ever tried to email gold? You can't <laughs> do it. But with Bitcoin and other digital currencies and digital assets, you can email or you can transfer electronically that record of debt. And that's why when you're talking about digital ecosystems, you're really saying we need a better way of capturing our records of debt. And you, it's, it doesn't matter if you're the, if you want to go back to the gold standard or if you want to go and break, if you're a Bitcoin maximalist, people just fundamentally have a hard time of saying, no, this piece of paper is valuable because it's money. I'm like, no, that piece of paper is valuable because it's a record of debt that's been passed on through the millennia. Same thing with gold. Hmm. I think that the institutional guys, how do they make their money? They want to make money off of fees. If you, if you transition to a blockchain-based ecosystem, 
where there's transparency. Remember this group text message? Mm -hmm. I can see how much the bank is charging me in fees to send a wire to do um, cross-border payments. Right now they go through like five or 10 correspondence banks. Everybody takes their little bite. A Bank of America, they make, I think it's like 35, 35 to $40 billion a year just in overdraft fees. You mm -hmm. can't overdraft a Bitcoin. It just doesn't because hmm. either you have it or you don't. The traditional markets, they don't want to lose their gravy train of fees. And as a result, they will fight any innovation that prevents them from maintaining their gravy train of fees. Yeah. This is where, whether it's Ray Dalio or whomever, it's, yeah, guys, gold was a, gold is a horrible anything other than using in semiconducting for electronics. Because if we want to talk about records of debt, it does need to be digital. It does need to be audible meaning you need to be able to audit it and it does need mm -hmm. to be transparent. That is inherently a blockchain based system, that group text message of transfers of uh, ledgers. And that's gonna just present some moral dilemmas because why are people so getting rich off of fees, number one? And then of course, Malcolm, you're gonna ask, why am I paying these outrageous fees? I would. Fortunately, I am since college removed from ever having to uh, to pay them, I think. But I remember thinking about how uh, unconstitutional they felt at the time paying $35 for a sandwich at Subway. Do <laughs> exactly. You, do you ever get tired of having to defend crypto to all the skeptics? Nah, I, I don't do. I'm not defending cryptos. I'm just telling people what they think they're going to do or what they think they're in, they're quote unquote investing in. Because I swear to God. Ask yourself, how does Bitcoin generate revenue? Mm -hmm. And that's a, that's a wrap. That's the end of the conversation. Because when you tell me it only gets more valuable because people buy into it, mm -hmm. that's literally called a Ponzi scheme. Yeah. My biggest problem with, I don't get tired of defending cryptos to skeptics. I get tired of d explaining to people why they should not ever have a 401k. <laughs> because you lose, you're good. if you're 24 years old and the retirement age is 68 or 70, whatever it is, you're going to lose 1% every year because you did absolutely nothing wrong. You are never, so, ever afraid of slaughtering sacred cows, man. I, I have to give you uh, credit that for that. That is such a racket. Yeah. That you, is such a racket. If you have a 401k, get a self-directed IRA because if you're going to lose 30 to 40% of your portfolio value in fees, you might as well just gamble it yourself. I actually appreciate that promotion because I do have a guest lined up later on in this season to come on to talk to us about self-directed IRAs and their many uses. Before I get way too far down the tracks, giving away the programming schedule, let me just ask you <laughs> sort of my outro question that I like to throw at every guest. If you had never heard of crypto or blockchain or any of the rest of the stuff that we're talking about and money wasn't a factor in your decision making at all. What do you think you'd be doing right now? Uh, I'd be training to be an astronaut, or rather, astronauts are the Uber drivers of space, <laughs> meaning they take people to space. Then it's like, thank you, Uber driver. Then it's the business you do in space. The space economy is worth about $400 billion today. We are having this conversation courtesy of the space economy, you satellites. If I had never heard of Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies, I would be prepping to engage in one of the infinite number of careers that will be occurring in low earth orbit in the moon. Uh, the US is going back to the moon to set up a base in 2024 underneath the Artemis Accords. That's what I would be doing hands down because you can, space is the only place where you can be a quadrillionaire. Hmm. And so I want everyone to enjoy being billionaires here on earth because my I might not be a quadrillionaire, but chances are my kids are gonna be quadrillionaires. And don't worry, we're going to charge the rest of Earth very reasonable rate. <laughs> <laughs> I had a feeling your answer was going to have something to do with space, but I figured I would let you get there on your own. <laughs> Thanks, Samson. As always, this was great, man. I really appreciate you coming on and having this conversation with me. Eric with an A, what did I miss, man? The only thing I can think of is Samson. If somebody's thinking, you know what, I need to get a hold of this guy because I need to attend one of these lectures or learn more or just know how to buy pizza correctly. <laughs> How do they get a hold of you? Just find me on LinkedIn, Samson Williams. Uh, you can go to samsonwilliams.com. I'm going to, I bought into, I'm about to close on an investment crowdfunding platform. So you'll be able to see a lot of stuff about that. 
Because again, you asked me what to invest in. You want to invest in the platforms that make investing in small businesses possible because customers have more money than investors. If you Google me at Samson, S-A-M-S-O-N Williams, you can learn about not only space, but the future of investing and particularly investment crowdfunding. Samson, again, thank you so much for your time today. I learned a ton, you know, old dog, new tricks, that whole thing. And uh, I'm a little disappointed that Malcolm only gave me a quarter, but at least it's something I can... I, I say I can call somebody who cares, but I think payphones are 50 cents now, so I'm going to have to scrounge up another quarter. Anyway, thanks again for your time. And of course, audience, thank you for tuning in and listening to the Tech Money Podcast with Malcolm Etheridge. If you have not subscribed to the podcast yet, please click the subscribe now button below. This way, when Malcolm comes out with a new podcast, it'll show up directly on your listening device. This makes it much easier to share these podcasts with your colleagues. Again, thanks for listening today. For everyone at Tech Money, our hope is that this show helped you make you a little smarter about your money. This has been the Tech Money Podcast. For more information on today's topic, to review the show notes, or to catch up on past episodes, be sure to check out malcolmetheridge.com slash podcast. And if you have an idea for a show topic that you'd like us to cover, or you want to send us feedback, the web address again is malcolmetheridge.com. You can also find Malcolm across all social media platforms at Malcolm on Money. This episode was written and created by Malcolm Etheridge with the production, the editing, and sound controls powered by top advisor marketing, Crowdmouth. This has been a Malcolm on Money original. Thank you for listening. The information shared in this recording and by its guests represents the views and opinions of the guests and does not represent the views or opinions of the host. This content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. This content is not, nor is it intended to be a substitute for professional financial advice. It is always recommended that you seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your personal financial situation.